Okay, we're going to start. Good morning. Good morning to everybody on Facebook, and we're glad you're here with us today. Uh, we are. This is going to be our last chapter on Solomon's Temple. So uh, I'm sure there's a whole lot more that we can glean from it, but I wanted to give a message to some of our members that are home in bed watching this. To Norma, I know she's not doing well, but I don't know where Wad and Sandy are and uh, Lisa. So as I told you all, if you miss service more than twice, I'm going to block you on my Facebook so you can't watch this. <laughs> not really. <laughs> but uh, there is such a thing as bedside fellowship, right? You ever been there? Bedside fellowship? We have a friend that says that's where she goes to church. It's taming. I won't say her last name, but that's where she goes to church at. So that's all right. So uh, I was uh, studying this morning for this lesson and writing it. And... Um, I, uh, I'm so excited about what uh, the Lord showed me the last couple of weeks about brass. Don, you and uh, uh, Ronnie haven't heard this, but I, the Lord prompted me to look up the metal brass and study in the, for the temple and everything. And I discovered that there was no brass whatsoever in the Old Testament. It's all copper. When you look up brass, it says copper as fine gold. But it was actually copper and it was polished to look like fine gold. So there's so much revelation in that. Because uh, uh, the outer court was really not God. Now that we know that God didn't require all that, uh, the outer court was not God, but they thought it was God. And so when they looked at things, their perception was that this judgment and this requirement and all the blood and everything out there was God when it was not. And I'll talk a little bit about this a little bit more. But a lot of times people give God credit for things that's not God, right? Earthquakes and hurricanes and and cancer and all kinds of stuff because they think that God created it. You know, they go to the Old Testament, they see where God created uh, good and evil, but it doesn't really say that. It said God created good, but out from man he got evil. It's an antithesis. And so, you know, like I blessed you that you would be rich, but what you did is you became poor. That's an antithesis. So I'm going to continue this. Uh, in this last chapter of my book here, we're going to talk about a smaller part of the temple, and that's the pillars. Uh, as you entered into the temple, there were two pillars, and it's an important part of the temple, as all of it is, but it's a very important part. And like I said in the beginning, we've not even begun to glean everything that we could glean out of this book, but it would just take forever and ever and ever because the gospel, to understand the gospel, it's a never-ending thing, right? It's, 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 a, it's uh, just unveils more and more and more. Brother Garnet explained it like a giant onion. There's so many layers of that onion. And the, the, the deeper you get to the center core of it, you just have more and more understanding uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to glean from the pillars. Pillars are important. They hold things up, right? Don, I'm sure you've been around the building and you've seen where they do pillars. Some of the pillars are put into, into the ground. Uh, so they hold the foundation up. Some hold uh, the uh, roofs up, tops of the buildings. I'm sure our big uh, building downtown, what's it called? The Devon. the Devon Tower. I'm sure it's got a lot of pillars. And I would imagine it goes really deep into the ground. I was talking to my son yesterday. He's bought a really nice pile of sand on the beach in Pensacola. It's called a lot, but it's a lot of sand. And the sand goes very, very deep. Mm -hmm. And so they have to build things. I think he said that has to be on pillar is 13 foot tall but the the pillar that goes in the ground has to go in 35 feet or 25 feet excuse me 25 feet into the ground they have to drill into the ground and I said well what does that hit does that hit rock or what and he said no it's still sand but they they calculate 25 feet enough that that sand holds that pillar sure and so pillars are very important for us and like I said they hold things up I want to read to you from 2 Chronicles 3.15 if you want to turn there. I want to do a couple of references in Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 3.15. So, hello, Carl and Ann. Good to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> we had our uh, cruise party last night. The people going on the cruise together got together and Ann told us everything we're going to do. So, <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. And then we men slaughtered them at a, a game of cards. We did one, didn't we? <laughs> they slaughtered us at another game of cards. So. That's normal. That's <laughs> normal. All right, so I hope you have that Second Chronicles 3.15. It said, also he made before the house two pillars of 30 and 5 cubits high. And I thought that was interesting because Nathan's 
pillars for underneath this house are 35 feet, you know, for the house that they're building in Pensacola. They have to sink them down 25 or something like that. But uh, so he made before the house two pillars at 30 and five cubits high. Of course, we know cubits are a little longer than a foot. They're about from the elbow to the fingertips. So they're actually more in foot than that. And the chapter, I, I thought they misspelled that, but chapter, it means in circle or the capital of a column. So it's talking about the, the top of that column, the chapter is what that means. That was on the top of each of them was five cubits. So that's a really big, big pillar, you know, five, at five feet plus whatever the distance is, probably seven, eight, nine feet round. And he made chains on them as in the oracle and put them on the heads of the pillars and made a hundred pomegranates and put them on the chain. So they hung off of that. And he reared up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and called the name of that of that hand, of that right hand, Jason, J-A-C-H-I-N, and the name of that on the left, Boaz. And we'll talk about that more later. But we want to look at the pillars that were at the entrance to the temple. It's very important. You know, again, whatever you see in the Old Testament, you've got to say, what is this picture in the New Testament? because the Old Testament is nothing but physical pictures of spiritual truth to us. Even the, Paul said that the, the children of Israel were in samples to us, so we should learn from them, learn their decisions, what they did, and things like that, and the consequences of it. So these were two identical pillars. They're one on the right side and one on the left, and they speak of, uh, of Jesus the head, and they speak of Christ the new man. Now, some people have other understandings of this, but what I call a most holy place understanding, that's what it speaks of, because everything pictures Jesus and his redemptive work and who we are as the body of Christ. That's what God's interested in, right? You know, it's just like him, God's the father, we're the children, we're the sons of God. And so that's his interest. So we could say Jesus the conqueror and the many-membered man, that's more than a conqueror, if you would. And that pictures that to us. So in Revelation 3.12, uh, I'll let you flip there real quick. Uh, somebody told me on the internet I don't give them time to go to their scripture. I'm really bad about that because I don't have time to let you look for it. <laughs> I want to keep going. If I had to wait, I start thinking about things and I start chasing lamb trails. So I like to stay on track. But Hebrew 3.12, I'm sure you have it. I mean, Revelation 3.12 is that him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no, no more out, and I will write upon or in him the name or nature of my God, and the nature of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name or my new nature. You know, when people read the King James, there's so many words that have been mistranslated or, or used wrong, like it says you've got to overcome. You don't have to overcome. You're in the overcoming one. So anytime you read things like that, think more of not something you have to do, but an awareness you have to have. That's how I have to overcome everything that hinders me in my life. I need to have a greater awareness that that's not my source. That's not my peace. That's not my help. Right. That's not my financial support. How do I overcome loans? Mm -hmm. You know, constant loans. I realize that that's not my supply yeah. because it comes with bondage. So. I want to read to you my translation from my uh, translation of the book of Revelation. It says, To him who has clear, keen, knowledgeable understanding and can speak swiftly of the understanding that Jesus' decision to redeem man was the decision that affected all. And that's, you need to start replacing the word judgment with decision when you read the Bible. It's a decision. What did Jesus do? What did God do? He decided that he was going to bear everything that was in man. He decided that he was going to rescue man. That's, that's what the word judgment means. There was a decision made, and I'm thankful for that decision. It says, I will cause the one, that one, to receive an infinite, excuse me just a second. Thank you. I know. I, wish, <laughs> I hate that. You ever do that? Yes. You need to sneeze, and you think you're going to, and it goes away. So I'm glad I did. It can get, it can get loud. <laughs> So I will call that one to receive an infinite awareness of righteousness being in all men and as most holy place temple, and he shall no longer be without understanding. And see, when people wake up to that, that awareness, then we, we are without understanding. We, we have understanding. Our awareness needs to realize it doesn't come from 
tons of reading books and everything. It comes from listening to your Holy Spirit, to, the, to your mind of Christ. So, and I will engrave in his conscious awareness, our, our mind of Christ, our spirit, my character, my image, my supreme divine nature. So also the true character, life, and image of my people, as I am, they are. Amen. They are, all are, my most holy place dwelling. He who has understanding dwells in it and draws from the spirit life, draws from the mind of Christ. Being supplied by my supreme divine nature within, therefore they are as me. So what is it going to take? No, no works, no labor, no rules, just understanding. And that's why we seek understanding. And for those, uh, and I'll say this, for those on the internet that keep saying that we don't need any more understanding, I'm sorry, but you're sadly mistaken. Uh, the whole Proverbs and Psalms, it all talks about, you know, particularly in Proverbs, that David says, seek understanding as it's a herb. You know, it's, it comes in, our, in the womb of our heart and we need it. We need to seek and ascertain and desire to know more and more about what Jesus has done and who we are. And that's what's going to help us. So we see in the entrance of this temple, again, two identical pillars. We find in the book of Revelation, the overcomers, or we could say the awakened ones. You know, again, some people, when they see overcome, who, to he who overcomes, they again think it's a, some kind of work or quitting something. Never thought that. Boy, I overcame that habit. Well, when, if you did it with works, then you're going to have another habit. Because you're still going to go after some kind of desire to bring peace to you. So the overcoming ones, the awakened ones, are pillars, uh, are, are, are pillars for the many-membered man. What do I mean by that? Well, when I awakened, I became a pillar to help people that haven't awakened yet. Correct? And that's what that means. And so they are pillars for the awakened, for, to help the many-membered men. They, uh, they are anointed, in other words, to awaken others as overcomers. It's that great network marketing. I wake you up, I teach you, you wake other people up, you teach them, and it just keeps going and going and going. Our job is to wake people up. That's how I introduce myself at my uh, uh, funeral seminars to wake people, you know, to prearrange funerals. I tell them in my ministry, my job is to wake people up to who they are. And here, I need to wake you up to something that you need to do. So my whole ministry is just to wake people up constantly. <laughs> And in the natural, I'm the one that wakes Donna up every morning. So, <laughs> so they, we want to get people to the point of realizing with revelation knowledge that they are as the overcomer today. And we are more than a conqueror because we don't have to conquer anything. We just live out of he who, who did the conquering. And what did he conquer? He didn't conquer a devil. He didn't conquer demons. I still people, see people preaching demons and devils and all that. He didn't conquer any of that. And the truth is, none of that really existed. He conquered the degenerate nature activity that was in man that produced a life of living death, hell, and the grave. Living in no awareness of God. And that produced every, everything that hell ever was taught. That's what man's experience in this earth today. And the grave was living totally dead with no awareness of God whatsoever. You don't think my brother is going through hell? That's hell. <laughs> you know, divorce is hell. Any sense of lack in all films or realms of life is hell. What we've been going through in the political system, Carl, it's hell right now. You know, and we just keep thinking, what's going to happen? You know, the country's going to go under. But I say, but God. I believe God has a plan. You know, I believe that God can take Donald Trump and turn his head, I believe he's willing enough. Yes. And I believe he's not going to have any strings pulled on him because he owes nobody anything at all. You know, and if you're, if you're not for him, I'm sorry. I, I hope I haven't run anybody off from our fellowship or stopped people from listening to me. But I have a right to be for somebody just like you do. And I believe preachers need to stand up and talk. I mean, I teach you other things. Why can't I teach in that realm too? I put a, I put a post on Facebook the other day that we're talking about how the political system's falling. And I said, the same thing's going to happen in the religious system. It already is. The yeah. medical system, the financial system, the social. It's all got to crater because it's all based on sensory realm and greed. And so we need to understand this. So, so these are anointed people to wake people up. And we do have to wake people up everywhere. Why can't the church wake people up to the fact that we need to eat right? We, if, if we would eat right, if we would grow our own vegetables... You know, if we would do the thing and then fight against the corporations that are greedy and they put all this stuff in our food. How do you do that? You quit buying from them. Yeah. 
How do we deal with the banks that's not giving us any interest on our money? Pull your money out. You know, invest your own money other ways. Buy and sell things, whatever. You, you can, literally, family, you can go to garage sales and buy things and have a garage sale next week and make 10% on your money. Not that you want to, but you can make much more money than giving it to them to invest and build their beautiful banks. And we can just talk about that in every one of those systems. So, I know, Donna, I'm getting on with it. I can read my wife's mind. <laughs> She didn't do anything, but I know who she is. <laughs> but I'm just saying, we need to wake people up. That's our mission. And it's not just to church things. It's the, the whole way of living. This is not life and life, uh, life abundantly. This system in the world is not the, the way, the truth, and the life way of life. I don't know if y'all remember me teaching that at Destiny Life Center. But I've taught a whole series on the way, the truth, and the life way of life. And that's what Jesus came to bring to us. So the letter to the sixth church at Philadelphia reveals an overcoming people as pillars in this house. An overcoming people are pillars in this house. And so in the world today, there are spirit-minded people, then there, there are carnal-minded people, and then there are fish of the sea people. <laughs> Did that sound good? What are fish in the people? They're people who are just basically, who are in crisis, but they're dead to understanding these facts. Totally dead. You know, not just, just a little bit dead, but totally dead. So the fellowship at Sardis picture those who are dead but still in Christ. They're still in Christ. And I'm going to read this from my translation, Revelation 3.1. This is to the church at Sardis, or the congregation. To the messenger pastor of the congregation who gathers in Sardis, write to them of what I reveal to you, saith I am. So this is God, the Spirit of God, speaking to the messenger pastor to that church, which was Paul and other ministers there, of course. Saith I am, light, life, spirit, in the matured messenger of the church. Everything in your life is empowered by me. Now, here, here goes an exhortation. Everything in your life is empowered by me. Well, you should wake up and say, oh, well, then I need to quit this, and I need to quit you know, trying to get it this way and go into these systems or whatever. I need to realize that he empowers me yes. and express by the understanding. So I could say, and ex experienced by the understanding of my great and marvelous work of redemption. So family, we already have it, right? Paul says that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness in us right now, but we need to possess that. In other words, we need to use that. We need to live out of that. Then he said, however, I'm aware that your deeds and your work and your labor are empowered by law and works rather than through my great marvelous operation." For that reason, what you do looks like you're in tune with your spirit. It looks like it. It's just like in the outer court. It looked like God. It looked like gold. It looked like a divine nature of God, but it was copper as bright as shined up to look like gold, but it wasn't gold. Just like many people come to church, and Ann did it this morning. She shined herself up very well. <laughs> you know? We have churches all over the world with people that look really, really nice, but if you go home and see what they're really involved in, it's not necessarily God, even though they are Christ the new man, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, you are viewed as dead. Remember the priests in the Old Testament that were set free from Babylon, they couldn't prove their Levitical priesthood, so they were considered as polluted. They weren't polluted, but they were considered as polluted until somebody could stand up with some Urim and Thummim, light on perfection. And that's where the church has been, what's called the church, and everybody else, they're considered as polluted because there's nobody able to teach them who they are. Just like those people over uh, all over the world now, radical Islam people, not Islam, I'm not speaking against Islamic people, but radical Islam pretty much teaches them that they're polluted, and if they'll do this, then they're going to get that, all right? And the church is just as guilty, yes. Yes. just as guilty. So we should not condemn them. That's where they were raised. You know, I do condemn them for cutting people's heads off, but I also condemn people for, for uh, gossiping. Mm -hmm. And condemn doesn't mean condemn to hell, <laughs> you know, or something like that. So therefore, you are viewed as dead because you have not finished what you started with faith. You came in with faith. 
But then you let people come in and sow lies to you and say, yeah, but you got to do this and you got to do that. The Pharisees said, can't you just let them be circumcised still? You know, or the Jews, excuse me. That's the Pharisees. And so you've not finished it where you started with faith in my work. In your congregation, you have people who are dead to me, which means dead in Christ. They're not awake. They don't understand. And then you have people still working dead religious works, still dead in Christ. And then you have a few who are alive. In other words, they're beginning to wake up. So that was the message. That was God's exhortation to the church at uh, Sardis. These pillars were at the entrance into this building of glory. Too many entered in uh, to what we call churches today, and there were no pillars to lead them or guide them into all truth. When they came, and I'm not speaking against people, but I'm just saying there were ushers, and there were deacons, and there were Sunday school leaders, and there were board members, and there were people there to say, oh, we got some more workers. We've got some more tithers. Pastor I grew up with said that God told him the way to get more offering is just to get more people to join the church and teach them to tithe. Well, that's not what we were taught, uh, called to do. We were taught, caught, we were called to teach the gospel of Jesus yes, Christ. Yes. And so very few people's ever walked through a church building where there's pillars there ready to lead them and guide them that are anointed. In other words, they've seen something and they're ready to teach them. That's why we're hungry for people. We want people to come so we can teach them who they are Amen. and not who they're not. There were plenty of leaders, though, ready to put them to work. Now, think about this a minute. Uh, we'll go to another verse. Uh, uh, I want to go to another uh, verse that the Holy Spirit really brought my attention to this morning. And I want to show you this nature of the building after it's completed. And what is, who, what is the building picture? Us, right? We're the building of God. In 2 Chronicles 8.16, it should already be in Chronicles. No, we're in I should have kept your finger. Keep your finger there because I'm going back. I forgot to tell you that. We're in Revelation. Okay. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 8.16. Now all the work of Solomon was prepared under the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord. That's the name of that temple. Not really Solomon's temple. It was the house of the Lord. That's the nature. Name means nature. And until it was finished... So the house of the Lord was perfected. What have we been trying to do? We've been trying to perfect the house of the Lord ourselves. We've been trying to make people, and it's just like I'm teaching in my book on, the, on the biblical counseling for the college. I'm trying to get across to the student. It's not your job to perfect them. They already are perfect. It's your job to wake them up to who they are. It's your job to give them an a, 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 a anti to what they're going after, for peace, and that anti to what they're going after for peace is Christ their life. Yes. Not get them saved, not get them filled with the Holy Ghost, not take them to a deliverance ministry, mm -hmm. but, but teach them what's inside of them is greater than what's in their memory yes. or in their brain or in their desire. He that is within you, your spirit man, is much greater than anything in that man that's into the world, right? Yes. That's the best counseling you can ever yes. do. You know, I could sit down with Don today if Don came to me and said, Pastor Roy, I've got a problem with eating ice cream, and I don't just eat vanilla ice cream, but I, I eat chocolate almond, <laughs> and I eat banana splits, and I put fudge on it, and I put pecans on it. Don's smiling really big, so that's his problem, you know? So I'm going to say, Don, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me, because you know why? I've had that problem before, too, but do you mind if I tell you what I found out? Then I can teach you and say, I want you to know that God is your sugar daddy. Yes, <laughs> I said that for them because they didn't hear it last week. God's your sugar daddy. Yeah. God can give you all the sugar that you want. Yeah. And it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to affect your body because it's pure sugar. It's the everlasting Amen. river that flows and yes. flows and flows. And do you mind if I teach you who you are now? Yes. And teach you how to draw from that? Wouldn't that be better counsel? Don's still thinking about ice cream, though. <laughs> I made a mistake. I told them they can pick where we can go eat today, so I think they're going to say Brahms. <laughs> so we know that the word perfect is the New Test is a New Testament word, and it comes or perfected. It's actually the Hebrew word is perfected. The New Testament word is perfect. 
It comes from a, a Old Testament word, shalem, S-H-A-L-E-M, shalem, and it means complete, and also it means especially friendly. And in that, uh, in the King James, it's, it's full, just, made ready, peaceful, perfect, quiet, the whole. Shalem, S-H-A-L-A-M, is the whole, and it means it made the whole perfect. It also means to be safe. Mind, body, the whole estate of man is whole, it's safe, it's rescued. It says to be, to be completed, again, to be friendly again. And uh, I, I think that has to do with our relationship with God, right? One with God. If you're friends with somebody, if you're really, really friends with somebody, there's nothing can separate you from that, right? Amen. You can you can see my weaknesses, and you can I could be a person that calls you by the wrong name every once in a while, <laughs> and you're never going to separate yourself from me. Amen. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> so, look at the picture here. There's a brazen altar, and here again, we know that's not brass; that's mm -hmm. copper, as in uh -huh. fine gold. Okay? So there's a copper altar which pictures the cross. That wasn't God. The cross wasn't God's desire. The, God, the cross wasn't God's purpose. Man needed to see that. That was man's way of killing people. But man needed to see that. So it's 20 by 20 by 10 cubits. 20 by 20 by 10 cubits, that brazen altar. Pretty big. And there is a huge molten sea, which we talked about last week, which is a bath for cleansing the priest. If you feel like you need cleansing, drop into that sea. Yeah. Drop into that revelation of what that picture is. Bathe in that and keep feeding on that and eat on that. And it'll show you that you've already been cleansed. And then you'll rise up and say, I don't need this cleansing anymore. I need to feed on it for other people. Right? Then there's the porch at the entrance of the temple, which is 20 by 20 by 10 cubits. Meaning it's the same square cubits pictured in the brazen altar. So this shows us that the entrance of the temple has something to do with the finality of Jesus' passion. In other words, you know, the girls sing a song, that our, our praise and worship leaders sing a song called Walking Out of Who I Know I Am. So you had that, that altar, that sacrifice, and then the porch is the same thing. So what do you do on a porch? You walk on it, right? You tread about it. You, in other words, you're living out of everything that Jesus did. My, my, where I walk in earth today, and an awareness walk, I guess, would be living out of the awareness of God. I have a voice with inside of me, and you do too. And every time something anti comes against me, I hear, but God, but God, but God. Yes, it looks like our country's going under, but God. You know, are we any more blessed than anybody else on planet earth? No, but we do have a people in this earth who are awake to the truth. And I believe we have many, many more than the news media is reporting that we have. Mm -hmm. I saw a picture on Facebook the other day, and I posted it, but it showed uh, Hillary's crowd with a very, very small <laughs> people, and it said 85% uh, for her, and it showed Donald Trump's crowd with tens of thousands, and it said 15%. See, that's the, that is the lie that's been propagated, and, and the same thing in every system of this earth. So we had to not believe that stuff, right. right? If you believe the news media, it's over with. Yeah. If you believe the advertisements from the medical community, it's over with. You are going to have your first heart attack, mm -hmm. right? I see that commercial all the time. It says, when you have your first heart attack, and I just turn it off, I've got to the point where I know it's coming, I don't want to hear it, but we are, we, we've got to realize that that's the voice we don't want to hear. That's the voice of Antichrist. Antichrist, our life. So, enter upon this porch, these two pillars. You enter between them. This house is a picture of the perfected body of Christ. It's a glorious people. It is a people in full awareness of the Spirit of God within them. It's a people who have tuned into the Spirit and are listening to the Spirit. The Spirit of God speaks constantly to you. As you walk around, you can hear, consider the lilies of the field. You can, you can look at something and you can hear something that pictures who God is. All you have to do is tune in. KOMA is broadcasting right now. Do you know that? Our radio station. The waves are in here. All you've got to do is be able to get something and tune into that and you can hear that. When you're out into a, in a crowd, there's people talking all the time. You literally have the ability to stop and focus on what 
They're saying back there. Do you know that? You can make your mind focus in on what Sandy says or you can, or what Lottie says. You can tune into that. Am I not truth? How many of you are go, sometimes are in a crowd? Sandy, you've been in a crowd when your kids were little and they were away from you and you hear a baby go, Mama! Well, how do you know that's your child? Because you're tuned into that. You're used to hearing that, right? Yeah. And so the more and more we listen for the voice of God and practice the presence of God, the more and more we hear it. Amen. You know, I used to get upset with Donna when I was the preacher. You know, I was the pastor, associate pastor at Full Gospel Assembly. I mean, I've got my license. And yet she's always hearing God. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing is she tuned in a lot more than I did. I had a full-time job. I was busy doing the work of the church. You know, this and that, she would be shut into her prayer closet mm -hmm. with a blanket over her head, getting everything out because she had three kids in the house. Mm -hmm. Sometimes she'd be in the bathtub with the door locked saying, do not enter, do not disturb, just exaggerating there. But, but she, she was tuned in. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I couldn't hear God. I just wasn't practicing that. So I, I want to emphasize that it's a full awareness of, of who we are. And full awareness that Christ, my life, supplies everything that's needed. It's all from within. Job says, my help cometh from within. We have all things that pertain to natural life. My help comes from within. My brother's help comes from within. He's to the point right now that I don't know that I can, you know, he, he's ready to go. Yeah. But his body is completely wore out and he's ready to go. You know, but I, I do believe that we can get to this point before our body wears out. Yeah. That we can't, we do have the strength to tap in and to draw out of that. I, I'm thinking of Carl's brother-in-law. You know, the little that he knows about the finished work of the cross, I believe it's enabling him. He was diagnosed in January with pancreatic cancer. He's not taking the treatments. He still comes and plays cards with us. He still does stuff. He's 80-something years old. He has some struggles a little. He limps some. But there's no physical sign that the man has cancer, is there? I can't tell it. And it may be gone. <laughs> I mean, because the, the, your belief is powerful. Yes. Jesus said your faith has made you whole. You know, so what we got to do is be able to put our faith in the whole gospel, not just, well, God's my healer. I mean, that's one thing. And sometimes people experience the healing. Mm -hmm. But we, what God wants is for the permanence to take place in our life. Yes. That's where I put faith. And I'm putting faith that I do have all things that pertain yes. to life and godliness, yes. and it, it affects everything. I don't lack nothing. Amen. You know, one of me and Donna's biggest uh, 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 contentions sometimes is Donna, she, she believes, I'm just using this as a physical picture, but she believes that, that we'll never lack for money. But she's always reminding me, now don't go spend a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> and that bothers me. She's okay, and I understand, because I'm the spender, she's the saver, but I just, I don't want to think in that realm. If I go somewhere and I feel like I need something, I'm going to get it. Now, I'm not going to frivolously buy things that I shouldn't, although I have. But, but you, you get what I'm talking about? We need to live out of where we walk with a no-need conscience. That's what I'm trying to bring Donna to and all of you to, is to walk with a no-need conscience whatsoever. I don't need anything. However, I do need to be wise with what I have. Not that I'm going to run out, but I don't want to waste it. Right? Correct? Am I right down the face? <laughs> well, whatever. That's what she said, guys, on the internet. She just, y'all need to pray for my wife. So, <laughs> so I've got a line here. I put in, and I've got a line in my book. Put your name here. In Carl Smith. In Lottie Jones. In Roy Richmond. In Donna Richmond. All of you. Is the divine glory being displayed? If you could see what God sees, you are his very image. Every time I look at my children, I see myself, my grandchildren. What's the first thing, Ronnie, when your grandkids came out, really, what were you looking for? Huh? Who do they look like? Yeah. Who do they look like? Yeah. Who do they look like? Well, my kids, I want them to look like me or Donna. <laughs> they better not look like Carl. <laughs> I saw myself in them. But what we've done is we've taught people that they look like humans. 
that we don't look like God, that we're just sinners saved by grace. We sing that precious song, you know, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I hate that. You're not a wretch. No. You never were a wretch. Change that to who gave new life to me, yes. who quickened my life. Mm -hmm. So just as the house was finished, we're finished. We are to go on to perfection, not to be perfected. The original teacher that taught me this said it was something that was going to happen, but it's not. We, we are perfected. We need to go on to, to living as perfect. Live out of who you be, not who you're not. I do not think God would tell us to, to do something when he said the work is finished. He did it. So if you're sitting under a ministry that tells you to do something, they have not seen the finished work of Jesus Christ, and I say run. I'm sorry, but I say run. If Don, if you go to a doctor that treats you for diabetes and they've never studied diabetes, they don't know anything about diabetes, but they said, you know, Don, I heard through my pharmaceutical salesperson that if you'll take this, that look, why don't we just try it and see how it works? You need to run. I want a doctor that knows what they're doing. If I have to go to a doctor, I want a doctor that knows what they're doing. I want a pastor that knows what they're doing. That's why I've aligned myself with three, two ministers that we all feed together and we study off of each other and we, we, you know, we, we know what we're doing is correct. So there's nothing else for Father to do. All that is left for us to do is to be who we be. To be or not to be, that is the question, right? He was right. To be or not to be, now, I forget the man's Hamlet. name, but he was wanting to, huh? Hamlet. Hamlet, yeah. He was contemplating committing suicide. Isn't she intelligent? I know. She's so smart. She <laughs> but he was contemplating suicide, so he was deciding to be or not to be. Lots of people are that way today. There are people literally that commit suicide because they decide, I can't be who I want to be, or I can't be who I was told I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the reason we needed anointed instructors of righteousness. There is a perfect work in what these pillars reveal. They point to the way, the truth, and the life way of life. They point to a freedom. They don't point to laws and labors and works. They don't point to trying to please Jesus. They don't, they don't point to anything that is anti-Christ to your life. We get to this finished work this way. You don't want to... It sounds like a, a, a waymark talking, if you would. A person who says, walk on this path, follow this path. What you're looking for is in a direction, it's back behind you. What you're looking for is not to become something. You look back behind you and you see a finished work. You see how you were made to be. Just like uh, Moses' tabernacle, they made, first thing they made was the most holy place. The very first thing. But then they made the holy place and then they made the outer court it was a, it was a behind you this is who you are but you got to look back here to see how you got here because we will not believe who we are and see how we how we got there how we have a right to live this life in isaiah eleven 12 i'll just read it to you it says that he shall set up an ensign an ensign is a way mark or a banner for the nations and shall assemble the outcast and outcasts mean people who are pushed down and driven away what pushes you down and drives you away? Religion, right? Man-made laws, rules and regulations, trying to do to be. The more you try to do to be, the more it drives you away from God. If you do anything, anything that you think separates you from God, then it pushes you away from God. I've talked about it many times. You just really mess up like Don and just eat gallons of ice cream this week and all the stuff that you put on it, and then he turns on the radio and it's some kind of, I worship you. He just turns it off. Yeah. Why? Because you feel condemned. Right. You, you really do. It's happened, hasn't it? Yeah. It's happened to all of us. Yeah. Right, Carl? <laughs> not Carl. <laughs> no, of course not Carl. <laughs> but it, does, it condemns you to the point that you can't even lift your hands up and sing the praises of God. Yeah. Or you feel terrible about it and then you do it and you hear, hypocrite. You, you, you see, your brain's accusing you. Yeah. What is that? What is that in your brain that accuses you? It's the law that's still there. It's the stuff that was ingrained in us from childhood. And that's why we need the truth, the truth, the truth, and nothing but the truth that will make you free from all of that. And sooner 
then later it begins to perish and it begins to go away. And then all of a sudden you realize there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And all are in Christ Jesus. So there is no condemnation. If I mess up, I'm still redeemed. But I'm going to say, Father, I know that wasn't good for me. It wasn't representative of who I am. There's consequences to my body. And Father, help me. Strengthen me. Help me to listen to my pastors and my teachers. Help me to take this for myself. For the next time, I don't drive by Brahms. I go a mile around Brahms. Because I know that's my weakness. Right? So. <laughs> I'm not preaching sin conscious. So if you want some ice cream, eat it. <laughs> so... We get to this finished work this way. We, we get to it the way uh, walking on this path and living out of this path. Uh, the outcasts are the results of religious men pulling down people, religious teachings. Then in Isaiah 30, 21, and I like this, it says, Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk you in it, when you turn to the right hand or when you turn to the left. What is behind us? The finished work of Jesus Christ. So every way I walk in life, I walk out of that. I realize that the answer to any situation in my life is behind me. And I listen to that. I listen to that and I allow it to change my life. There's no future changing that we need at all. We just wake up to who we are. Now, let's look at these pillars some more. 2 Kings 25, 17. I'm just reading a short verse, so you don't need to go there. But it says, the height of the one pillar was 18 cubits. The height of the one pillar was 18 cubits. These were both 18 cubits high, and the number 18 comes from 6, 6, and 6, right? And what does 666 mean? It's the number of man. It's not antichrist or anything. It's the number of man whose breath is in his nostrils. It's people before the cross that, that were that, that way, and people after the cross still had their understanding coming from the five sense realm. So that's what that's speaking about is the number of man there. So I can hear people say, well, I thought you said this was Jesus in his body. Well, what we find in the book of Revelation chapter 13, this number 666 is talking about the sensory man. Jesus became that man, right? Jesus became, he was the federal head of the human race. And so on the cross, he was 100% man. 100% he had given up every bit of the Godhead and he became 100% the condition of man whose senses comes from the, from the sense realm, the five sense realm, and he had all that degenerate nature activity in him, 100% of that in him. So we find the height of this is 666, which is the height of a man. People always felt the pillar represented Jesus and his body, but it doesn't. It represented him becoming man. The other pillar pictures the result of that, Christ the new man living out of what he's done. So it speaks of a particular union with Jesus. And you remember, the Bible says in the, in the I forget the book in the Old Testament, but God said, I will meet, I will marry the cherubim. And the King James, it says, I will meet you between the cherubim. They added the word uh, between, and the word meet means marry. So he said, I, I will marry the cherubim, and men, no gender implied, were the cherubim. Men were here to bless the earth. The word cherubim means people of blessing. So I'm going to marry you. I'm going to become one with everything that you did. Now see, people think that means I'm, I'm going to marry you in the marriage supper of the Lamb. But no, I am going to become everything that you have become. I am going to take that all into myself. And I'm going to destroy that. And I'm going to make that void. Isn't that a better understanding? Yes. So uh, people have always looked at it the wrong way. They've always seen Jesus separate from man. But this was God speaking of the one man plan. The one man plan. So this speaks of Jesus as identifying with man out of his work, producing a many member in Christ of man, no longer bound to the sensory realm. We do not have to walk by sight. We walk by faith. I, I know you guys love me. I do not walk by sight. I don't look for anything to prove to me that you love me. I don't. I just know you love me. Now, there are some fellowships I've been part of. I didn't know it. You know, I didn't know. But I know you guys love me, and I can live out of that. And I'm telling you, it's nice. Even I don't have to have a thousand-member congregation love me. Just 
two or three of you love me is enough. <laughs> right? And when I say me, I'm talking about me and my lady. I feel your love. And how much more does God love us? We're not bound to, oh, Roy didn't shake my hands today, or Roy said something bad, or Roy called me by a wrong name, or <laughs> I'm playing with my girl that I love very much. <laughs> but we're not bound by that, are we? Because if we are bound by that, it splits churches, it destroys churches, it destroys relationships. I've had people have the wrong perception of me and I never got to be friends with them. I've had the wrong perception of people and I never got to be friends with them. Yeah. You know, I've had somebody tell me, why didn't you ever like me? Why didn't you ever, well, I just thought that they were too good for me. I had this wrong perception. I've always grown up, and Donna can tell you this in the younger years, thinking people were always older than me, more mature than me. I always felt less than in their sight. I don't know where that came from, but I always felt less than. That's not a good state to be in, is it? It's, it's miserable. First Chronicles 18.8 8 says, Likewise, from Tip, I don't know how to pronounce all these names right, but Tip, Tip Hath, and from Chun, cities of Hadar Ezra, brought David very much copper, wherewith Solomon made the brazen sea, and the pillars, and the vessels of copper. So this 666 cubit high pillar was made of copper as fine gold. There again, it looked like God, but it wasn't God. It was man needing a judgment. It was, it was Jesus making the decision because God gave the wrath to Jesus. God gave the judgment to Jesus. Jesus made a decision. God in him made a decision to completely redeem man. So we know that because Samson was bound with fetters of copper. It says gold in the King James but it's actually copper. He was bound with that. And so in the teaching of the law, we learned that the curse of the law is that we do not, do not obey. I need to correct this. I put, if we do not obey the law, God would curse us, right? Is that what we were taught? We, we were. We were taught that. In the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 28, it says that the skies above thy head would be copper or brass, but it would be if you do not obey the law. And they did not, if they do not, then the curse is upon them. Well, actually what it was is where it says above your head, in other words, that would be your awareness. The, the, let me read it again. The skies above thy head would be copper if you don't obey the law. So your head is your awareness, right? And so your highest understanding, the sky is the highest that we can see, right? So your highest understanding is a curse. Because you think you can do it by the law, and you can't do it by the law, so you feel like you're cursed. So it was a perception. God wasn't saying this to them. God was saying, your perception, if you don't obey your law, is that you're cursed. Am I making it clear enough there? Your perception. I'm not going to curse you, but you feel like you said you can obey the law. You're trying to follow the law, and you know if you don't obey the law, you're cursed. Just like today, if we don't obey the law, we're going to get arrested, right? And so these people thought that God was cursing them, God was not cursing them. It was their perception, or it was the condemnation uh, coming from, from them. It was the consequences of doing to be. The consequences of doing to be. So if one believes righteousness comes from obeying the law, then he or she will always fail, and they live in the sense realm of being cursed. I didn't give enough time. I lost my job. You know, I didn't serve enough, whatever it is. And so we have this consequences that we think comes from God. And, is, and they had the very same thing. So when a person lives by the law, the skies above their head, their awareness is clouded. And guess what? Paul wrote the same thing to the church in uh, uh, Corinth. He, he talked about uh, the same consequences of not living on your spirit. He said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Remember that? I understood as a child. I thought as a child. So when you, he talked about the maturity level of people, little children, sons and fathers. So when I lived as a little child, I thought as a child, I talked as a child, uh, I, I always felt condemned. But he said, I put away childless things. For now we see through a glass darkly. There's the same thing. Our awareness is darkly. When you look in the outer court and you see copper, it, it's, it's, uh, 
copper as gold, it's not quite gold, right? It kind of looks like gold. It kind of looks like God, but it's not clear. And so he said, but, but then, now that I've grown up, now that I have a great awareness, then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. Now he was teaching them. He was already there. But he said, then, Donna, when you wake up, then you're going to know, you're going to understand, you're going to see these things face to face. A face to face relationship is the most intimate relationship there is, right? Isn't that cool? So he shows the same thing. It reminds me of that song I can see clearly now. You remember that? Written by Jimmy Cliff. It says, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. The confusion has gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Uh, they're gone are the dark and clouds that, that, had, that had me blind. It's going to be a bright day now, bright sunshine day. It's going to be a bright day. Oh, yes, I can make it now. The pain is gone. All the bad feelings have disappeared. Do you think he knew something when he wrote this? Here is that rainbow I've been praying for. It's going to be bright, a bright, sunshiny day. Did we? Huh? I know. I was calling Kay, and I was telling her when I was writing this that that came to my mind. She was telling me how they sing that in her church, and there's some other people that sing that because I can see clearly now. I, I don't. I'm not blind to the truth anymore. So we know when the children of Israel. I'm almost done here, but we know when the children of Israel murmured against Aaron and Moses, serpents came into the camp. God didn't send them; they allowed it. It's consequences. They they walked out of their protection, if you would. You know, they were to feed on on manna and they got tired of manna they got sick of manna burgers and manna splits and everything else that you make with them manna shakes what else sandy there's a lot more in here <laughs> manna dogs <laughs> whatever but they got they got sick of it and they and how many people do you know that have got in a sense satisfied with feeding on the finished work of the cross and they left went after other things so what do you do if you're not feeding on the truthful word, then you allow other things to come in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people that go after uh, other teachers that say they're teaching spiritual things and they're not. Mm -hmm. They're trying to bring them to a, another, like worship the universe and the creation and all that. There's consequences to that because you're cutting yourself off from your life source. That's and that's what Adam did. Yeah. So to answer Moses' prayer, because Moses went and said, God, what do I do? God said, put a copper serpent on, on a pole. The metal copper, again, always speaks of Jesus' decision, right? So there's another picture that we, if you'll look up at what Jesus did, and you'll look up the decision that he did, he did, then even if they're biting you, you won't die. Even they, And if you'll just keep looking, they'll even go away. You just keep looking. So that wasn't God doing that. That was their consequences. But God's always got to answer, Rod, for your consequences. You know, yeah, maybe, maybe you smoked all your life and, and you do have cancer in your body. Or maybe you drank alcohol way too much all of your life and you've got cirrhosis of the liver. That's the consequences. But God's still got to answer for your consequences. If you feed and you feed and you feed and you feed and you feed, it can deal with that and it can bring permanence of life. I mean, I was telling my brother there's a lady, I don't know who she is, but many years ago you've heard of her, that she was diagnosed with cancer and she refused the treatment. She locked her up, herself up in a room and she had her family bring every funny DVD they could bring, or CD or v VCR, whatever it was on, and she laughed herself well. It is a fact. You can look it up. It happens. She laughed herself well. Laughter is good for the what? Laughter is good for your entire body. It releases what? Endorphins? Things that can bring healing to you. Sadness and crying is not good for you. Not crying remorse. So viewing this serpent was a tool to raise the people's awareness. The cross, it's not from God. It's not God's desire. But it can be used as a tool to wake you up. And Jesus knew men needed to see something. And so he became that, that ram. He became that lamb. God provided himself that ram. God didn't provide a ram to Moses. I don't believe that. I think, I mean, Abraham, I think Abraham still thought he needed to sacrifice and he looked around and he saw a ram and that's a good out of court, out of court picture. But God was saying, Abraham, I don't want to sacrifice from you. 
That's what I'm trying to show you. You've lived in this realm where you think gods need sacrifices. I'm the one and only God. I don't need a sacrifice. I'm going to provide myself a ram. Yes. See, that doesn't fit that he told them I don't want this, and then he gives them a, lamb to a ram to sacrifice. Doesn't fit at all. God was the ram. God was the lamb. Yes. The lamb of God. He was in God. He did this. So the metal copper always speaks of a decision, a decision being made. Viewing the serpent was a tool. The spiritual truth of that picture is when one focuses on his problems that come out of living in that dust realm, the, realm, the true need is for me to lift your head up, for somebody to lift your head up and say, look up, that's where your, your redemption is. Now, I, I don't know if it's scripture or if it's tradition that says our redemption draweth nigh. No, maybe it draweth nigh in our awareness, but it's already there. We need to wake up to that. So what we must understand is what, de what decision it speaks of. Jesus said in John 12, now is the decision of this world. It says King James judgment, right? It says, now is the decision of this world. If I be lifted up, I will draw all unto me, everything that traduces or hinders man. I will. That's the decision right there. That's the judgment of God. He was saying all that traduced man was drawn into him and the decision is that he would bear it all and then die, and in dying, it all died. It's appointed once for man to die, then the judgment. I used to think that that was all men. You've heard me preach it a hundred times. I think it was appointed for one man, one man to die the death that was in all mankind. I now believe that that's what that said. No one had an appointment with death. Before the cross or after the cross, nobody. This is the first time this came to my mind just now. And I believe it wholly that we did not have an appointment with death. God wanted man to live. Amen. Man could have awakened before that, but man needed to see it. We had two men. We had uh, Enoch, right? Enoch that woke up and just rose up. He was not anymore. He was no longer a man that lived out of a sense realm, you know? And so they, they woke up before the, before the cross. But man was waiting to see something. They had to see a physical judgment. I don't know why, but they had to see that. So the true need is for us to wake up. Uh, Romans 5 said, By the offense of one, consequences came upon all. Well, who was the one? It was Adam. So of Adam, all missed the mark. In Jesus, everything that needed to die, died. And what needed to die was the degenerate nature activity. So... It's important for us to understand this. The degenerate nature was placed in him, and he bore the consequences of all humankind. And so those pillars, and we're going to talk about them more. I've probably got about two more lessons in this. I haven't written the whole chapter yet. But those pillars represent a revelation of Jesus becoming man at the federal head. The other pillar is a result of that, Christ the new man. That's what holds everything up. Without that, all your preaching is worthless. Without that, all your teaching all your counseling, everything is worthless. You've got to have these two pillars, and they're standing on a porch that's the same size as an altar, which means people walking in there are already in it. They're already involved in it, and we need to teach them to live out of that. And living out of that will bring your life back to a marvelous life. And that's what needs to happen to the whole world. It needs to happen in the United States of America. I think America right now is just a picture of what's going on in the whole world. But I still believe God has blessed this country. I believe it's highly favored. I believe it has more people, contrary to what the news media says, it has more believers in this plant and on this in this continent than they're saying. I believe that. When you've got tens of thousands of people showing up, they're looking to a man that's not a politician. They're looking to a man that they believe, and they're praying over that man. Yes. Yes. And uh, I believe he's a believer. I have lots of preachers that have been preaching to him and sharing with him. I wish we could get to him. They never know. We may be able to someday. But I believe God is using him. How can God use somebody that had affairs in the past? Well, then I ask you a question. How could God use you? Yes, amen. How could God use me? Not it's not about me. Not We're one man and he can use all of us. King Cyrus didn't worship God. And God used him to set the captive free. And I believe he's raising people up. And you know what, family? This, this is pretty tough. But most religious leaders today, God can't use to set people free. Because they, they, they're stuck. 
they're stuck and they don't think there's anything else. They're, they think they have to tell people to do stuff. Uh, Lisa, you know, was, was uh, accused of preaching a greasy grace. Brother Garner was accused of preaching a greasy grace. I have too, you know, because people are bound up in religion. Mm -hmm. And so God can go out and get anybody who wants to do it. I mean, who am I? <laughs> you know, I don't have the, according to a lot of the popular preachers out there, I'm just Roy. You know, who's Roy? He's just somebody in a little dinky church in Oklahoma City. They're not big, so that must be something wrong with them. But that's not the way God works. Yeah. He, he uses the simple things to confound the wise. Amen? Amen. So I believe that. Uh, <clears throat> I believe that this teaching here, once we finish, I believe this is something we can refer back to over and over and over. It's really going to help us to explain things to people. I'm going to do some videos, more videos on this for the school and have this as part of the school too. So we're excited about that. Let's pray. Father, we just bless you. We love you. We thank you for uh, uh, the life that you provided for us. We thank you that you love man so much that you were willing to come and be in a man, live as a man, live and walk among men, and uh, show us your nature and your character through your son, Jesus. And I thank you that Jesus was willing. I believe he had a choice. He, he had to settle who he was and his purpose. And he could have said no. He could have just stayed here and been the only fully aware God man on the earth and could still be here today. But that wasn't his purpose. That was his purpose was to remove everything that hindered man from living the way you created us to be. And we thank you for that. We thank you that the word is going forth and you've enabled us to minister with a clear sounding word. And Father, I, I received an email today asking us to pray for this political system. So I do that, Father. I pray that the person that you have for this hour will be selected uh, to, to be our leader. I know you're our leader. I, I know if we'd all wake up, we really wouldn't need polit politics. We wouldn't need politicians. But currently we have them. And I know that you've worked through people, Father. So I pray for all of our politicians, our senators, our congressmen, our legislators, our governors, and, and uh, all of them, Father, and particularly our president-to-be, that uh, there, there will be a quickening take place in these people, that they will begin to make righteous decisions, that they will care for the people and care for this country. I personally believe Donald Trump does. And I just pray that you will wake people up to that, Father. There's so many people that are blinded by their political uh, choice, whether to be a Democrat or a Republican. And they're, they're not so much concerned whether they're right or wrong. It's just they've been that way all their life, and that's what they're going to stay with. But I ask you to help us to listen to your voice and for people to awaken and look at the, the differences and realize which one's going to be the end of this country you know, in the way that it looks, Father, or the one that's going to be right. So I pray for wisdom and knowledge, and I pray for the voice of spirit to quicken people to do what's right. And then when the leader gets picked, help us to do what you tell us to do, and that's pray over our leaders and not gripe about them and not gossip about them. And we just thank you for that, Father. We do this in the nature of your Son, and we give you the glory. Amen. 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 Those of you on the internet, uh, several people have been asking how to send in million-dollar gifts, so you can go to my PayPal and my webpage. Oh <laughs> I can hear them out there laughing. <laughs> no, I'm playing with you. But if you do want to support the ministry, you can go to my webpage. There's a place doing that by PayPal. So I'm not ashamed to offer that to you. Uh, I'm spending more and more hours in doing these. And also, uh, if you want to be on my email, please send me your email address to my email. Don't do it on Facebook. Just do it. Send it to Dr. Like Dr. Roy E. Richmond at cox.net, cox.net. I'll add you to my email list, and every time I write a chapter to a book, you'll get it. So we love you and bless you. If you have any questions that you would like answered on these broadcasts, if you will just email that to me too, I'll do my best to answer that question. If it's not answered, then I probably don't know the answer to it yet. <laughs> I don't like to try to if I can. So we love all of you. It's a, a blessing that you're here. Uh, sometimes there's upwards to three, four hundred, one of them almost 500 people have joined with us on the internet. So we can truthfully say we have a very large congregation now. So thanks for being with us. God bless you. See you next week.